Morning, everyone. Right, we'll make a start. We may still have a few people joining us, um, but we'll make a start for now. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to another one of our sharing leading practice sessions. Um, we've hosted quite a few of these now this term. These were historically known as leadership development days, um, and these are an opportunity for schools within our network to share an area of best practice. Um, and one of the few positives that has come from COVID is the ease with which we can now share fantastic practice from our schools, the length and breadth of the country. So we've hosted quite a variety of sessions over the course of the past term. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce you to Jess Renner. Um, Jess is um, the Vice Principal at Ashfield Academy, which is the lead school within our Ashfield hub around sort of Leicestershire way. Um, Jess is, as I said, Vice Principal and she's the lead on teaching, learning, curriculum and assessment and she's prepared a really fascinating session for you all. Lots of opportunities for interaction and looking at the chat, um, it looks like we're going to, we're hoping, to, uh, people are hoping to get lots out of this session. Um, just before we start and I hand over to Jess, I just wanted to quickly talk through some house rules just to make sure the session does run as smoothly as possible. Um, if you haven't already, and I see most, most of you have, um, please do mute yourself and remain muted throughout. Um, it just means the session can run really smoothly. We will be going out into breakout rooms at various points, so this will be a good opportunity, opportunity to unmute and, and chat to others as well. Um, but during the main session, if you could keep yourself muted. Um, as I said, there'll be some opportunities for interaction in breakout rooms, but any other comments or questions that you have as we go through, please do just post them in the chat. Um, I know that Jess has built in some time for questions, and so I will make sure to sort of uh, keep an eye on the chat and, and follow up with any questions that we have as we go along. Um, if you haven't again already, please do just change your Zoom name to your first and your last name. It just makes it much easier to record attendance and actually know who's here. And we can also um, speak to you on a first name basis. Uh, that'd be really helpful. We are going to record this session. Um, so if you don't want to be part of that recording, please do just let me know and we can make sure that you are edited out. Um, and finally, I will be sharing a feedback form at the end of this, um, so please do fill that out as it's really important to us and it does help us to shape future events and means that we can continually improve our SLPs moving into next term. Um, right, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand you over to Jess. Thank you very much, Jess. Went a bit fuzzy there, Georgina. But I think I think you've handed over to me. <laughs> oh, I have. I'm um, sorry about that. Yeah, over to you. That's okay. <laughs> Typical, isn't it? The, the the first bit of introduction and it went fuzzy. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully this is going to work for everybody. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. I will just start by saying, um, Georgina mentioned about putting the correct name. Um, in the box um, and for a while there we didn't have this session beginning at all because she wouldn't let me in because I was under my husband's name which is Will and I hadn't re <laughs> realised and I hadn't told her so that was a good start to the session so hopefully technically it's all going to go smoothly from now on um, thank you all very much for coming um, it's really lovely to have people um, join and I really hope that you get something out of this session although obviously it's a very weird um, way to be delivering to you all um, but hopefully the outcomes will be just just as good as if we were uh, meeting in person so um, now why is my oh there we go Right, so um, to start off with, um, I'm Jess Renner. I work at um, Ashfield Special School. Um, it's a four to 19 school. It's based in Leicester City. Uh, it's a residential school. I've taught a little bit about my background. I've taught for almost 20 years. Um, I specialized in drama teaching uh, when I started out. I taught um, drama, GCSE and A-level in secondary schools um, in Bedfordshire and then I moved to a sixth form college in Cambridge where I was head of drama. I taught for a little bit in another sixth form college in Nottingham and then I moved to Ashfield and that was a real change for me. I'd never worked in a special needs school before. I had no prior experience at all so I was very lucky to get that opportunity but I was very much um, landed in the deep end in that first year. I started off as a teacher um, of children with special um, severe learning disabilities and then I moved on to children working with children with moderate um, learning disabilities and 
I then um, took on a middle leader role. I was made head of arts. And then I um, led on what we now call the green pathway, which was the pathway for um, children with severe learning needs, really. Um, I then moved on to overseeing secondary for a short while as vice principal. Um, that was a secondment that turned into a permanent post. And I'm now um, leading on teaching and learning, which was something we sort of created last September. That, that role didn't really exist before. Um, so that's been quite an exciting um, thing to, to do over the last um, year or so. So as I said, it's a four to 19 school. It's predominantly for children with physical disabilities, um, but we have an increasing cohort of children with severe and profound and multiple learning difficulties. So that's been a, a shift for us, I would say, over the last 10 years or so. Historically, Ashfield was somewhere where um, children would traditionally sit GCSEs. Um, and we now have, I think, three children sitting one maths GCC this year. Um, so that has changed significantly for us. A number of our children do entry level certificate, but we have a lot who don't necessarily sit exams at the end of their time with us. And we've had to really spend the last decade reviewing significantly what our offer is. And it's been an incredibly exciting time to be at the school, um, kind of scary as well at times. Um, because we didn't always necessarily know what we were doing um, it was it was experimental but it's been fascinating and I've learned so much I think we have as a, as a whole team really um, and I'm guessing that some of you will be in that that situation now and I just want to sort of reassure you that it is it's a really exciting time and the outcomes can be so beneficial for the pupils so it's well worthwhile um, taking that time to review. Um, when I started at Ashfield um, they had just begun to adapt the blue pathway, which is our profound and multiple learning needs pathway. Um, the rest of the students were following national curriculum. It was adapted, but it was essentially um, exactly as it would be in a mainstream in terms of structure. We had heads of departments, so a head of science, head of English, head of maths, etc. Um, we didn't have pathways at that stage. So it looked very different to how it looks now. Um, and it became evident over time that that was no longer a sustainable curriculum for our children. It wasn't appropriate. On my next slide, really, I've tried to summarise an example of why that was the case. Um, I was very lucky that previously to coming to Ashfield, I had always done really well in lesson observations. Um, and then I, I came and I had a, this is an example of one of the lessons I had a, a satisfactory English lesson. And at the time, that's how we graded our lessons. We don't do that anymore, but we'd give them a grade and, and this one fell into the satisfactory category. And uh, I think that was probably very generous, actually. <laughs> it was a bit of a disaster of a lesson. The plan was, it was an English lesson. I was teaching um, children with um, severe learning difficulties. They, uh, the children had, a, a range of needs, including um, a child with a severe visual impairment, a child with moderate hearing impairment. I had four children with cerebral palsy, some in electric wheelchairs, um, some in manual. I had one nonverbal child and one severely autistic student. So a hu huge range. I was at the time using P levels. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with with those levels and um, really we were sort of vaguely using equals but there was no schemes of work in place um, as such and my intention for this lesson was to do writing and I'd picked my p-level um, uh, criteria that I was aiming for we were going to send a postcard um, we were going to read a story about visiting a beach I had some pictures I had some key words we were going to stick the key words onto the pictures um, we were going to those of them that could were going to write or have a scribe to write for them a postcard to send home all these lovely ideas I had a story to read to the non-verbal child that was related to um, a beach or a holiday um, and of course, none of this actually um, went to plan at all. Um, I, I think I did about a quarter of that plan, if, if that. Um, and I had my meeting with the deputy head at the time afterwards. 
and got my satisfactory uh, category. Um, it was a, a frustrating discussion because there was so much that I knew that wasn't right, but I couldn't put my, put my finger on what I was supposed to do to get it right. Um, and she asked a question at the time and it's sort of stuck with me since then. She said, had you considered whether they've ever been uh, on holiday or, or to a beach? And it seems so obvious, doesn't it? It's embarrassing really to admit that I hadn't. I'd just been so focused on the idea of writing and the postcard that I'd lost the sense of whether this was something that was relevant to them. And that's not to say that it isn't, but I hadn't been through that thought process. She said, have you thought if they did go to a beach, whether they've experienced sand or the sea, whether they can access a beach, whether this is something that they could do or would do. It was, it was just about putting the students at the centre of it and thinking about that experience. And I'm not for a moment saying that that isn't a relevant experience, but it, it needed that thought process and I hadn't given it. So I suppose the reason that I'm sharing that lesson and that experience with you is because it epitomises what was going wrong perhaps with our curriculum at the time. We were sort of taking P-levels and equals vaguely and forcing it to work for our students instead of looking at our students and going well what are their experiences what are their needs where are they headed in life and how can we best get them there how can our curriculum do that for them so i've asked a couple of questions here and i know that they'll be very different depending on the school that you work in um, and so I just thought if you want to share on the chat, this might be a good opportunity. Um, have a think about a recent lesson that you've taught or watched someone else teach. What were you or they teaching and why? And take a moment to consider what do you think as a school you're judging quality teaching and learning against? I'll just leave you for a couple of minutes to have a think and put in the chat if you, if you want to but I think it's an important starting point. Georgina, can you see the chat? Yeah, uh, nothing coming in at the moment. Um, okay, well, I think people fine. are probably just having a, having a think about it. That's fine. I just can't see it. So, um, uh, will you no, play I'll, it? I'll let you know. <laughs> Great. I'll let you know. Don't worry. Okay. I'll give you another minute to think about it. There's no pressure at all to put anything in the chat, but I do think it's important that you you have a have, make some notes for yourself um, because otherwise I don't think you'll... you'll um, get the most out of the session or at least make a note of the question so you can return to it I think that's really important but it's a it's not an easy question to answer I don't think and, and that second one is a particularly big one. Oh Jess there's one that's just come through um, from Kerry yeah. saying we judge against a set of learning statements we watch the learner actions more than the teacher. Okay Thanks, great. yeah really good so those learning statements um we, we did a similar thing actually um, last year and, and hopefully they're, they're your sort of starting point really. Um, and as, as, I, as the presentation moves on, um, Kerry, you might be able to return to some of those statements and, and have a think about um, whether those are the right things or not. They, they may well be, but this will be a good opportunity to reflect on them, I think. Just out of interest, Kerry, if you're able to put in the chat, are they statements that you've created as a school? across the trust okay great um, and Jess we had another one from Matt Smith as well saying a recent lesson observation of a teacher new to special um, so the lesson objective was writing to summarize and sequence a story the intended outcome was them writing sentences in order and they ended up copywriting from a whiteboard as none of them can write independently so we went on a huge journey with this teacher about what the learning was and what the function is and why is it important for the learners 
Mm, yeah, absolutely. And and that sounds really familiar to me. You know, I, I feel for that new teacher. That's that was very much my experience. Um, you know, going back to that that pl plan that I was talking about, that P level. I can't even remember what the P level was, but you know, had I thought about how many of them wanted to write or needed to write, how they could access that. Um, and that's something we've taken a long time looking at um, the relevance of the, the criteria that we're working with for each of the students. And that means we've got vastly different criteria. But that's one of the um, one of the benefits of special that we can pick and select what what's right for our children. Was that another one that's come up, Georgina? Sorry, I was muted. Yep. Um, also from Matt, just saying we also use a set of statements to think about the quality of teaching focused on learner engagement and the learning journey. Mm, yeah, brilliant. Good. OK, thank you for that. It's really, it's really nice to get some feedback as the speaker. Um, you sort of think, oh, is, is, uh, is anyone out there? So it's really good to, to hear um, your experiences. So <clears throat> facing the facts. Um, that experience that I talked about was obviously my own individual uh, experience, but I think as a whole team, many of us were were finding that increasingly questioning whether what we were doing was working um, and what it was leading to really. So we went through a process of um, uh, reflecting on the cohorts we had. That was one of the first things we did. As I said earlier, historically, we were used to having children with physical disabilities, but who were academically capable of sitting mainstream curriculum um, exams. And uh, that had changed. And it was one of those things that happened very gradually. So you almost didn't notice it happening. And it was a bit of a wake up call um, where we just started to count the numbers and say, we're, we're working um, on something that is suiting a, a small minority of our children now. So we need to look at the majority and what they need and then adapt um, and perhaps uh, some specialist provision for those who are still um, kept sitting GCSE, for instance. Um, it became evident that we had sort of three cohorts which became our pathways. Um, we have PMLD, SLD and MLD. And those are pathways that you find a lot in special schools now, but at the time, they they um that wasn't the case we we ended up calling them blue green and yellow pathways there was no particular reason for that other than that we didn't want to um categorize the need because there are children who may for for instance have severe learning needs but um be in a pmld class or vice versa and we didn't want to kind of limit ourselves with those pathways so that was a big part of our reflection who are our children now I was given the task as the um, lead for SLD, um, for the green pathway, uh, of, of sort of reworking that pathway. We'd already started that with the blue pathway, so we took a similar model. And that's literally what we've been doing, working through each pathway. So our final pathway, the yellow pathway, is actually in the process of, of launching its new curriculum now. So that's been, I would say, from start to finish, a, a sort of six or so year process across those pathways a couple of years on each so it's a long time it takes time um, and it can be nerve-wracking telling parents that you're making those changes um, and I think it, they can they can feel um, it, it's important to, to involve them and include them and explain why you're doing that so they don't feel that their children are guinea pigs or anything like that and that they're prepared for that change in, in process we um, you know, as part of our reflection, we questioned whether what we were doing was working. And when the when the answer was no, we had to be brave about it and say, well, we're going to have to do something different here. Um, we talked about whether we were setting them up for failure. And I think in some cases we were, which, again, was a hard thing to confront. Um, we had good discussions. We talked about who our pupils were, what do they need, what will or could be their next steps following Ashfield. Um, that meant some tough realities for some of our pupils and families. Um, for a lot of them, they will stay at home with their families. A number will live independently. For some of them, what's the most important thing for them is actually preparing to um, have a social life um, outside of their family life or um, adjusting to different staff in a residential care unit. There's, there's lots, there's a real range of 
um, destinations for our children. And we needed to start making sure we were meeting all of those different destinations and preparing them for all those different types of experiences and not just for, for one smaller cohort who were perhaps going on to college, for instance. And then we did consultation. So we spoke to staff um, they're experts, they're with the children every day, they know them inside out. For many of them, they've taught them since they were four years old. So we asked them, what did they think? Um, we spoke to parents, they're experts of their own children. They live with them every day, they gave birth to them. So what do they know about um, what their children want and what they want for their children? So I thought for this one, we'd go into breakout rooms. Um, I know I've put quite a few questions there, but I think they're important ones. And I think this is the kind of um, these are the kind of questions where it's, it was useful to have a discussion. Where do most of your pupils go after school and what do they do? By after school, I mean when they leave school. At the same time, where could they go and what could they do? How is your curriculum offer preparing them for that? What do they need to be able to navigate life? And can you offer more or better to help them be able to do this? So Georgina, I think we've said five minutes or so. Is that right? Yeah, I can go for five minutes. That's absolutely fine. Great. Great. Thanks. Great. Um, so I just thought, um, I was just saying to Georgina, actually, I'm really aware that some of these, these questions are, you know, very personal to your own school. Um, but I do think there's some benefit in, in sharing. Hopefully you had that opportunity in the breakout rooms. Does anyone want to share anything that cropped up in the breakout room or have any questions at this stage? Please feel free to put in the chat. I'll just give you a moment to do so if you'd like to. Okay, that's fine. Well, hopefully um, having that discussion has sort of triggered, I mean, it's very short, but it might have triggered some bigger questions that you can take back to your colleagues to discuss. Um, moving on to gurus. Uh, so after we'd sort of reflected on um, what uh, we felt, oh, I can see there is some in the chat. Shall I pause and we'll go back to those things? Sorry, was I rushing you all? <laughs> hard to judge. Georgina, do you want to share what's on there? Yeah, of course. Um, we've got a comment from Helen saying, we are reviewing what we call our pathways. I like the idea of naming them more neutrally. Great. Yeah. Yeah, that worked well for us. That's it at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you. We can, we can always come back to them if, if more things appear. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. So after um, we'd done this reflection and discussion, um, the the thing we then moved on to really was talking to experts um, we sent people out on courses we did loads of reading I would strongly recommend you give an awful lot of time to this research element one of the things that I think we're bad at um, as teachers and uh, uh, middle and senior leaders often is giving ourselves allowing ourselves time to read books um, it doesn't feel like it's proper work you know we have to do it uh, in bed uh, before bedtime because it's not you know it's got to be done in our own time um, I don't think that's the case you need to make sure that that research time is 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 given the, the hours that it needs that's very hard to do I know that um, but we did we did do lots of reading we did go on courses we did speak directly to some of the people that I've listed there Flo Longhorn, Penny Lacey, Barry Carpenter, Peter Imray we also spent a lot of time talking to our teachers what did they want to keep what was working what were they worried about what did they feel wasn't working? Um, and I guess I wanted you to take an opportunity now really to have a think about whether there were, um, whether there are any other schools 
And it might be that you can't answer this right now, but other schools with similar cohorts that you could visit, um, any experts uh, that you could um, read up on or go on courses for. SEN's tricky because there's there's not loads out there um, and you'll find that other schools are the leads really. They're, they're busy doing it. Um, but it's it's worth taking the time to have a think about that. Was that something that popped up in the chat? Georgie. Yeah, we've just got a question from Amy saying, once you have obtained which pathways you need to develop, how did you create the curriculum and how do you assess and evidence it? Okay, so I'm going to come to that in a minute. Um, but this was the starting point, really. Um, it was to go out and gather expert knowledge where there is expert knowledge um, to find out about the way that children with profound and multiple learning difficulties or severe learning difficulties or moderate learning difficulties learn. That was our starting point, really, the science, if you like. Um, so then, um, this is exactly what we did next. After we'd been on those courses and read those, um, that, those theories, we then went to visit schools. So it's called it Inside Out. We sent people from within our school, and it wasn't just me, it was a range of people, so that we got a range of experiences, out. And again, that was a commitment of time. Um, and it's very difficult during COVID. I know that was short staffing, but post COVID, hopefully, um, this is something you could do. Some of the schools we visited, Swiss Cottage in London, the Bridge, Victoria School, Forest Way School, Ellesmere, Oakfield, there were more, I couldn't actually remember them all. Um, but we, we visited locally and um, uh, nationally as well to, to try and um, get ideas of what they were doing they had similar cohorts some of them some of them were renowned for the curriculum they were offering so they were a really good starting point and again I guess it's about asking those question um questions to yourself Who, who's already um out there doing it well who have you heard of go and visit them get into their classes and see what they're doing it may or may not work for you um but it's it's going to give you something to base your discussions on and also um where can you find or draw inspiration from I think it's worth taking a moment again feel free to share on the chat if you want to but but there's no need to you can just jot it down but just take a moment to think is there anyone that you've heard of is there anyone locally that you could go and visit that you know would be good and of course you're very welcome to come to Ashfield once we once we're post-covid and we're allowed visitors <laughs> I'll give you a moment just to jot some notes So, um, so yeah, in, in terms of the, those steps going back to that, so we started with the reading around the theory, then we went um, out to the schools. We came back from those schools with resources that they'd generously shared with us. Um, we'd spent at least one full day um, watching in different classes. And we then had um, three days where a team of us came off timetable again it's a big timing ask um, and i could have happily spent more than three days doing it but we limited ourselves um, and we got uh, a massive roll of paper we put it out on the tables we sat around in a circle we did drawings on walls carpets we just did like a huge brain splurge of everything that we had read, that we had seen, stuff we liked, stuff we didn't like. And, um, and then we forced ourselves to commit. And we began by um, being needs led. We, we, we decided what the areas of learning would be. So for our PMLD um, blue pathway, we had already agreed prior to me being involved in this, that they would have um, communication, movement, discovery, social development, and enrichment as their areas of learning. 
So for SLD, which is what we were concentrating on at that time, the green pathway, we, we took a similar view to some of those areas. We felt that they remained important for those students, um, but we changed a few. And we called them my communication, my movement, myself, my thinking, and enrichment. And enrichment has two branches for the green pathway. One is my creativity, and one is how my world works. So once we'd got those areas of learning agreed, that sort of gave us our starting point. So after we'd done this big brain splurge, we had these titles and we then started to list under each the things that we'd already been discussing that would fall naturally into those areas that we knew were important to, to the children on that pathway. And that really formed the very draft framework for our curriculum for that pathway. And I'm talking specifically about that pathway because obviously the MLD one, as I've said, we're still working on. But it, it follows a very similar, for all three pathways, we followed a very similar structure. Um, and that would be my recommendation that you, you start by sharing all that information, what you liked, what you want to get rid of, and, and you start to get some kind of order. And we, we didn't look at the national curriculum at all. It's very tempting to go back to it um, as a starting point. But the reality was that didn't fit our children. And there are aspects of the national curriculum, of course, that um, come up, particularly with our MLD pathway. But that wasn't our starting point. And it was important to, to kind of almost get rid of that from our minds and not be influenced by that. Um, because that is written for mainstream children with mainstream abilities. We then looked at assessment. Now, assessment is trickier. Um, the MLD pathway, yellow pathway, is a good example because we've tried various things over the last three years. Um, we also did statements last year. This year, we have finally um, agreed to follow actually the same form of assessment that we do for the green pathway. I don't know how many of you have heard of MAP which stands for Mapping and Assessing Personal Progress. It's essentially a very um, broad and generic form of assessment. You could literally put any goal against it um, and measure where the children are at. The idea is you measure against four things, how much they need to be prompted um, to be able to do something, um, their fluency in being able to do that thing, their ability to maintain it, and their ability to generalise. So they're four very open, very flexible, um, easily adaptable assessment criteria. And that's what we use now for, for yellow and green. And that works really well because it means we can, we can pick any goal that suits that child and make it work in that, within that assessment framework. There wasn't a lot of choice, if I'm honest. And as I said, with the yellow pathway, we did go down our own route of um, creating our own statements initially. The problem was we found it, the same issue came up. We were constantly limiting um, what the, 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 the progress, I suppose, because they had to match that particular statement um, or they had to, to, um, to achieve a certain number of stars or ticks or whatever it was we were using to measure. And, and that's what's so great about a um, map. It's just given us the flexibility. We found nothing else that gives us that um, currently. Um, so yeah, that's what we decided for assessment. We knew we wanted clear and appropriate learning journeys. We didn't want work files. We wanted something that was flexible enough to reflect photos videos verbal accounts case studies um you know those of us who are from sem backgrounds which i think most of you are here um you know it doesn't work having having a file full of paper um because they may not produce paper um works at based work so it's important to have something that that captures evidence that captures their progress that that isn't limiting you so we we have learning journeys um, and, 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 and achievement folders, which is sort of a, a way of capturing all those things on the computer. Uh, we knew we wanted bespoke resources. So each pathway has their own set of things that are um, suitable for their curriculum. And there's a lot of things we need hands on stuff to be able to teach children with special needs. 
we knew from visiting the schools that we'd been to that that they had some very unique and special environments in which the children could learn so sensory rooms um pop-up tents uh some of them had um desk areas where children with um perhaps adhd or autism could would help them focus um there were some really lovely outdoor play areas and forest areas um outdoor gym type things that we we knew um would make a big difference to our curriculum offer and ultimately we we knew from all the research that we'd done and the visits that we'd made that we had to really consider what we wanted them to learn which was of course our areas of learning that we agreed and how we wanted them to learn and we knew that that had to be done by doing that if they were to pick up these life skills um, that we kept coming back to and these independent skills they had to be um, active in their learning so I thought this was another good opportunity for a breakout room. Um, I thought we could share what parts of your curriculum design or other curriculum designs um, do you want to keep, chuck or adapt? Is there an opportunity to experiment? So I'll leave those questions with you for your breakout rooms. Are we all back? Pretty much? Great. Okay, so um, I thought we might be brave um, and unmute ourselves if anyone um, would like to share rather than doing it by chat. I just wondered if, if you would mind feeding back some of the things that you, you think are working, that you think you'd keep, some of the things you definitely know you want to get rid of. Um, there's no judgment, just uh, this is a, an offloading session. So if anyone is happy to unmute, it would be really great to hear your, your feedback. I can't necessarily see you all, so do just uh, shout if you want to say anything. I mean, I should... So we were just... No, carry on. Go on, Helen. No, no, you're fine. So we sort of were uh, just talking about where we are in our journey of having a curriculum. So for us, it, we're at the very beginning stages and um, we need to be looking at how we are developing... Uh, a, a, a pathway or pathways um, to support children in what their next steps are post um, primary education because we are a mainstream with a resource based provision with okay. communication and interaction and so therefore we need to prepare so it might not be as in depth as what specialist has but we mm -hmm. still need those progression of skills open it's been really interesting just to hear what everybody else is doing so thank you oh good i'm glad really glad yeah so i guess it's about looking at where those are you, are you talking about the the unit specifically the resident the, the provision about where yeah. those can go yeah so it's thinking about what schools do they feed into where are they headed to mm -hmm. next what what are those schools expectations of the children and that might mean working yeah. with them closely so that they have realistic expectations high expectations but realistic ones um and similarly yeah. working out whether they you know how can you best prepare those children for that next step that's great thank you yeah. anyone else helen was there was there helen yeah it was me i mean i kind of shared that i was in a very lucky position uh, as curriculum lead and a brand new school uh, you know, I designed the curriculum from the beginning and um, it kind of goes from the pre-engagement all the way up to, I mean, we, we will not have a lot of children taking GCSEs. Most of our children will be within the pre-key stage standards and maybe accessing uh, pre-entry level examinations. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I shared is that we started with a thematic approach, which did come with some resistance okay uh, you know it's kind of like you know it's, you know when you are challenged by your ceo let's say and then so on you know how are you going to be but i have created a program of study i didn't start with the national curriculum i kind of created my curriculum then looked at the uh, national curriculum and make sure that I had elements of history, geography and so on throughout. But by having a thematic approach, 
um, I can have children working at the pre-key stage, uh, working within the engagement levels and pupils at pre-key stage standards in the same class because the overarching theme can be linked to all of them. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And so that, then, sorry. that's really, well, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because you, you've come from quite a different angle and hopefully that shows to everyone listening that there is no one set way of doing this. Just because Ashfield have done it this way, that doesn't mean that you have to do it in the same way. And clearly, Helen, your school's gone for that thematic approach and that's really working for you. Um, and I think it's, it's just about, it's about being a bit brave, isn't it? And about being decisive and trying something. And it may not work. And we have to accept that, that that's the case and immediately then take action. But I think it's... Um, it's starting with with what what you know with your children presumably that was where you began Helen that's where I began and I have kind of five pathways in a way mm. I mean you know I would say they they are three pathways but there's kind of five five pathways mm. because our children can move across the pathways because I'm very hot about not lowering the ceiling for our pupils mm -hmm. so our pathways are quite fluid for mm. our children to move right. across um, and then the pathways identify, you know, you know, which children will, you know, uh, we will not be able to meet their needs in post 16, which pupils we will be able to meet their needs mm -hmm. and which pupils may go off to local authority colleges and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have really looked at our pathways, our themes and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And when we plan the curriculum, we planned it from primary all the way up to key stage four and post 16 and there's links between the whole of the curriculum so we are revisiting knowledge and skills and deepening and yes yeah. there's still lots of life skills phsc you know it's mm. all in there we're mm. a very search school as well so it's all in there mm. brilliant thank you helen that's really um valuable and and um uh, did you share helen on the chat at the beginning where you were from no, I haven't, but I would do that now. I'm from the Grove That's School. Great. We are very new. We only officially opened. Uh, this is our second official year with uh, COVID in the middle. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, hope, I mean, it, you know, it sounds like you're well on your way and it may be useful for other people to get in touch with you to, to get some ideas. You know, um, you've been through that same process or are going through it. So um, it's really valuable to talk to one another about these experiences. Um, and, and I'm not the only one who can answer those questions. Helen is obviously in a good situation to do that as well. So that's brilliant. Um, it's interesting, Helen, you said something about, you know, um, the fluidity between pathways. And that's something we were, we were quite worried about when we created the pathways. And I do think that's worth looking at um, in your individual schools. Um, the pathways really work. We're really pleased with them. But it, it can be limiting if you're not careful with it. So um, give that some thought. And also that thing about, you know, lowering the ceiling as well. It's, it's really tricky with SEN. Um, I was astounded when I came in to Ashfield that I was expected to do science with children with profound and multiple learning difficulties. Now, there are elements of science that I can do, but the concept of a national curriculum based science lesson was just so inappropriate for those children. Um, and that's where the research came in, because it, it made me feel better reading people who have spent years um, honing their expertise in these areas, sort of reconfirming and reassuring us that actually it is OK to move away from those things. And um, but I think you go through that constant battle of you want to be realistic, but you don't want to limit their opportunities. So it's having that really open discussion about that. And we did. We, we were very honest with each other and we challenge each other and we question um, and we talk to parents about it. Um, and we've got a real mix of parents. We've got some parents who have very unrealistic expectations of their children's um, ability levels and needs. And we have some parents who. Um, who really are very protective and whose children could live independently but perhaps they don't feel that that's right for them so we have to have those very difficult sometimes discussions with the parents um but it's all it's all part of the process it's all it's all good stuff ultimately i think thank you both for sharing there um i'm going to move on to the next slide just because of time so going back to the start we looked at, we did all the research, we looked at gurus, we went out and saw other schools, we came back, we had these three days of um, mapping things out and agreeing a framework for the curriculum. 
Um, I should mention also that we we use specialist leaders in education and um, we hired a couple of people and we're still working with um, a couple at the moment for the yellow pathway who were from mainstream schools but we felt there was benefit in in getting some outside eyes in and we've really continued to do that throughout um, we had external consultants very early on after about six months of launching the pathway to to get eyes on what we were doing um, some were SEN, some weren't. Um, we asked colleagues, we involved our SALTs, our VI team, CAMs, anyone we could. We were saying, come in, look at what we're doing, what do you think? Because with SEN children, there are so many practitioners, um, so many different specialists involved in their lives. Um, from a medical perspective, from a behavioural perspective, it was important to get all those different opinions gathered. Parents, we did questionnaires has got some feedback from them um, we're part of class uh, a special schools network so again we had um, invited colleagues in from other schools to come and observe what we were doing and give us feedback challenge partners was critical in that I think that ongoing review is something we really value at Ashfield and of all the things that we do that is one of the most important for me and that is why I continue to work at Ashfield because I feel we are a school that constantly goes are we doing it right is there more we could do? Um, and celebrating what we are getting right, but but constantly reviewing and never resting on, on our laurels. And I would urge you, I'm sure you're, the, the very fact that you're here means that your schools are like that already anyway, but um, you may have staff who are less, less like that. And I would urge you to, to consider this question, how can you continue to review the curriculum offer? Um, how can you get the, those outside eyes in um, that you value and how can you take the feedback to then shape um, what you're doing that isn't necessarily something you need to answer now but I think it's an important question to, to continue to ask yourself Georgina have we got some um, some things on the chat yeah we've just had a question come through from Heather saying how did you find the time and money for all the changes so um, we make that commitment um, we make it as a whole school priority so for the green pathway that was um, one of our uh, priorities and therefore we made sure we had a budget to allow teachers to come off timetable for that time we had um, three of us initially and then we took another two people off for, for some of the three days um, we I mean, I, I feel a bit stumped by the question, really, because I'm not I don't oversee the budget in that sense. Um, the head and the business manager do. But but we we just made that commitment that we would um, we, we do have cover supervisors. I should add that and lead teaching assistants. So when a, a teacher is out or an LTA goes out to see another school, we would we would use the teacher or LTA to cover. And um, so we're lucky that we've got that internal cover um, sorted. But I, I suppose it is about planning for this. Um, if, you're, if you're making that commitment, and that means you can't start until next financial year, then, then plan for that and put the, mon the money aside because it isn't something you can do without, without doing visits or doing the research. That, that's my belief. Um, and it's also, I suppose, about having people in the right roles. So we have pathway leads who continue to have that as their focus. Um, and again, it's, it's making the structure work to allow for that, um, that to happen. I don't know how good an answer that is. Um, was that Helen that asked that? But I hope, I hope that helps. Whoever it was asked that, sorry. Um, Actually, you... Heather's just also said um, that she appreciates that it is very much easier said than done, <laughs> putting money aside. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I'm so aware that when I'm telling you all this, I'm making it all sound really easy. And it's been, you know, six, year, six years of hard work and questions and, you know, sometimes angry parents. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, it's not always smooth riding, but it's, it's so worth it when you see children learning what is right for them and what they can achieve and what um what sets them up for the next steps so much better it's I complete, really I complete sorry i'm going to, i'm going to speak because i'm my typing is appalling um <laughs> i i completely get that what what i'm struggling with is where you're um sorry i'll put my video on as well so you can see me um i'm a governor i'm chair of governors and one of the things is where where you're struggling to balance the books anyway 
taking teachers away from teaching um, where your staff and with COVID it's even worse because you're short staffed. Mm -hmm. um, it, so you saying, you know, just put it in the budget. It, it, that's, that's kind of very easily said, but actually mm -hmm. unless you're sitting on a surplus or surplus staff, I just don't see how you could, I mean, we're not, we're not a million miles from where you are. We have pathways and, and we are sort of very focused on where the girls are going when they leave us and, and their different pathways. Mm. Um, so it's not starting again for us, but I just, you know, going and doing all the research, speaking to everybody else, that takes time. Mm. And I just don't feel our staff have that extra time. Mm. And we couldn't afford, I don't think, to cover for them while they did that. And I, that's mm. why I was just wondering how you managed to do it within a, maybe you're better funded in Leicestershire than we are. Anyway, I'll now stop. No, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really valid point, Heather. I mean, I, I guess, you know, the thing to do would be to look at your, your um, setup, you know, if, if it's not possible to do it within the school day and release people, because as I said, it's, it's really our staffing structure that allowed us to do that because we have cover supervisors and LTAs in our classrooms who are there to provide that cover. Um, so that's kind of cost wise covered. Um, I think, you know, are there meetings that go on where time could be put aside? So, for example, if you have a weekly teacher meeting, could some of those be used to do some of the research or the discussions? Um, I, I don't know without knowing the structure of your school, but I guess it would be looking at where you where you have any flexibility of time. And if the lessons, um, if the, if the school day doesn't allow for that, are there are there training opportunity uh, training days that you could use? Um, and I suppose when I say about making that commitment, it is, it is about pre-planning. It, it, it won't happen without some time being dedicated to it. We've had a lot of time. You don't necessarily have to give it that amount of time. But I would say it would be very difficult to do that without some time somewhere. But I, I fully appreciate, Heather, it's, it's you know, um, I'm talking pie in the sky um, for some No, people. that's fine. I think, and Matt, Matt has commented, I think the use of training days is a good idea. I'm going to go back and suggest that. But, it, you know, we've already got our next few training days focused on other things because we're changing yeah. our how we deal with behaviour in the school. And that's a mm -hmm. wholesale change. So, you know, I've got to be we've got to take it one thing at a time. That's right. Yeah, definitely. So can Was I there anything else in the chat, Georgina? Sorry. Um, yeah, just Matt's comment that, um, that Heather mentioned, just saying that he had um, they very much had the same challenges within their school um saying that they did a bit at a time and had to be quite creative about how they could upskill and expose their teachers and staff to other practice so again they did use yeah. things like inset days and meeting times and so on as well thanks matt for that brilliant we also, we also did um it's probably just easier for me to speak rather than tired we also did things like we identified maybe how many days that would take in terms of getting our teachers around the table to to implement that um realized we couldn't do it in inset days and things but then looked at how we could um structure a so we did days that were less teacher focused and that we used other staff members and other support staff to be able to deliver curriculum on days that we could then release you know small groups of teachers at a time but we weren't covering classes. We designed complete, you know, enrichment days or other activities or things where we joined classes together so that we could release teachers in small groups to go and, because the, the, the power of it for us was that we came up with the concept, but then we put it in the hands of our teachers and said, go, you know, go and work out what this looks like. But we couldn't do that unless we gave them time to do that. And it wasn't easy to do that. It was really, it was really hard, like you said, in terms of time and, covering classes and all the rest of it and especially at the moment in current circumstances but um yeah we looked at things that required less teacher input and how we could then release them to protect that time to be able to go and develop that um, can i say i mean uh, we also had the same issue with finances and so on but um you need a driving force for the curriculum so i kind of structured most of the curriculum then I worked with my head of departments so they can look at their departments. But I sneakily used to lockdown. I had, so, I had weekly meetings with people during lockdown and we literally put so... I know, I know that's not going to happen again, hopefully, fingers crossed. But I used a lot of that time 
working with all the staff across the school in developing the curriculum that went through, our progression guidance across the curriculum. But I still meet every week with my head of departments to discuss the curriculum and make sure it's completely where we want it. And then I have curriculum meetings scheduled with the class teachers after school. It's part of their directed time to work on the curriculum with their head of departments. So it's something you've got to plan well in advance in a way. Yeah, I, I would agree, Helen. I think it is something, and, and as you, you, know, you mentioned, Heather, step by step, you, know, you, you obviously have your school priorities every year and behaviour is your current one. I guess it's about looking ahead and saying, well, when that one's over, is that the time to look at curriculum? And maybe everything that you do, all your training, all your teacher meetings, all those additional things at the end of the day um, are just committed to curriculum, which is kind of a scary commitment, but maybe that's, that's necessary because the curriculum is ultimately everything it's the core of everything so I, I would argue personally that it, it it should have that kind of time and, and it would be okay to cancel everything else and just focus on that but um but obviously I can't comment on individual schools what might be useful Matt is if you haven't already maybe just share your school as well so um Heather could always get in touch with you afterwards to talk about some of them it sounds like you've had some really creative ideas about how to make that time that might be useful for Heather Thank you all um, for those comments. I'm going to move on to the next slide because of time. This is the last one. Um, it's probably quite a relevant time to say, what do I know? Um, I think it's important to, to remind everyone that, that, you know, I've been saying it all through and it's, it's sometimes frustrating, isn't it? When you come to one of these workshops and you think, I just kind of want the answers, but I can't necessarily give them. I can only start that discussion. Um, what, what we have is a catchphrase and it's very cheesy and I can't even believe that it's caught on, but we ha we, everything is hashtag one team at Ashfield these days. Hashtag one team, hashtag one team. And it's kind of an, an ongoing joke, but actually I've grown to love it um, because it sort of sums up our approach really. We are hashtag one team, that's everyone, the staff, the parents, the students, we're all in this together. And I can read as many um, Barry Carpenter recovery curriculum things as I want and he's a brilliant man but he still can't provide me with those answers we have to come up with that ourselves as a school um, and it does take time and we are still working on it and we will continue to work on it but we did we did it we are doing it together um, we're talking very openly about what's scary we're talking very openly about what's not working and what is working um, it's important to have those honest conversations. We have um, a very thorough quality assurance processes at Ashfield um, and sometimes it can feel like uh, you know you get so bogged down in quality assurance you think are we are we actually doing anything else but of course it's taking the time after you've done the quality assurance to to then act on whatever the findings are that you've discovered. We have pupil progress meetings every six weeks where we um, discuss in depth the children's progress. Now I know that we have small classes so that is possible and it may be that for those of you that have larger numbers in each class you, you select a number of case studies to look at. Um, we have uh, learning reviews which is where our wider leaders take an area of, of what they oversee and they do a kind of deep dive into that area and they, they feed back on what their findings were and, and that then helps them to act on next steps for their area to improve it. We do drop-ins, so we don't do lesson observations at Ashfield, we do drop-ins where we don't tell teachers necessarily that we're coming and we try and make it a really regular thing so that people can't put on their best lesson ever because that isn't going to be useful and it's not going to be um, a slice of what's actually going on in the classroom but it's very much the discussion afterwards it might only be 10 minutes but the discussion afterwards is very much about the teacher leading it it's self-reflection um, and we set some kind of a challenge or a thinking question afterwards um, that the teachers respond to so we we the idea of that is we're trying to have ongoing short regular conversations around what's happening in the classroom so it doesn't become this annual um thing that happens to you where slt sweep in and give you a grade and sweep out again i'm sure schools don't do it like that anymore but they certainly did when i started teaching and it's really nice that we've moved away from that and we're finding a much more positive um uh, outcomes really from that um, we do lots of cross school moderation, even if the schools are following completely different curriculums and different assessments, we still work with them, find that really useful. 
Um, we have impact reports that we do. So our specialist practitioners, anyone that comes in um, who, from outside who does interventions with our students like tutors or musicians, we get them to do an impact report with some case studies of the difference they're making to the children through their, their slice of the curriculum offer. Um, we do work scrutinies and um, we have pathway meetings as well uh, every month where the pathway leads meet with their team of teachers and they talk about what's working and, and what's not working or where any training or support is needed within their pathway. And next year um, we are starting something called pods, which is where once a week we're um, doing a sort of assembly style um, morning where the, the class team get 45 minutes once a week to, sorry, once every two weeks to meet as a class team with no agenda set by us. That is their class team to lead on discussing anything within their classes. Um, so again, that's a time thing. We're very lucky that we've managed to make that happen. Well, it was supposed to happen this year, but obviously because of COVID it hasn't, um, but it should start next year. So there's lots of chances for us as a school to step back and look at what we're doing and discuss what we're doing. And we still have con external consultants coming in and obviously Ofsted as well. Um, so I'm slightly aware of time. We've got 15 minutes max. Um, I wonder whether rather than going into breakout rooms, Georgina, we just get some verbal feedback. Now people are sort of happy to, to um, openly chat. I just thought these two questions were good ones to end on really. Um, how can we can continue to celebrate the curriculum? Because I'm sure that there's a lot that you're doing in your schools that is really working. And how can you ensure reflection continues? So I don't know if anyone wants to offer any ideas on either of those things. Hi, can I say something? Yeah, please do. Okay. Hi. I joined in late, so I don't know if someone said this already, but it might be worth mentioning. Um, what we've continued to do is uh, what we call like our wow days, like our um, theme days, and we celebrate those, um, especially yeah. now that the children can't go out anymore and they've lost um, their school trips because we're just trying to be um, a bit cautious. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, for um, this week, I've been doing um, what they call, um, they, they're cooking three dishes from around the world in three different, three different continents, just right. as part of their history celebration. So just continuing to have things like that. And year two had like a ball day, like their Cinderella day for their reading. So I, I think those kind of moments can celebrate Lovely. the curriculum. Yeah, thank you. We also um, do wow days. That's what we call them as well. And um, they're, they're so much fun and they are a real opportunity for the children to show off what they've learned um, in that particular topic or learning area. Um, so I would really recommend that for anyone that hasn't tried them, some kind of celebratory day. Um, we have diversity days as well, but the, the, this is more about the pathway finding something that you know where children made real progress and and they really want to find a way of um celebrating and sharing that lovely idea thank you anyone else or if anyone's got any brilliant systems for for reviewing so we use a system called um iris which is we've just introduced this year, which under massive kind of sceptical, <laughs> it was it was feared to start with, which is essentially a self-reflection system, which with two iPads, which you set up in a classroom. And the idea is that you have an online account and those iPads record practice for however long, and it can be used for various purposes. So we've used it to observe particular children where it's difficult to go in without kind of massively distracting them or we've used it for NQTs and uh, we've used it in place of lesson observations sometimes and the whole point is that they those reflections get uploaded to an account that's online that that teacher has ownership and control of so it can we are encouraging teachers to use that as a way of 
reflecting on their own practice and they don't have to share that with anybody um, or for things like um, NQT observations it's just a better tool than going in for 20 minutes and then it encourages mm. that self-reflection and you've got the evidence kind of taught and we've taken those recordings to TAs and had a team meeting about it and saying you know watching yourself back what would you then do and that was a yeah. that was a really that was a really different shift for us yeah. in terms of yeah we're used to a model of oh people who know more than me will come and tell me what i need to do next yeah yeah to a to a conversation of how can we make this better we yeah, don't know all the really answers but let's we've we've done a similar thing and i imagine there's a few people here today that have had to move to videoing and it was you know it was hugely anxiety inducing for some of our teachers but i'm really pleased to say you know it's actually had a massively positive um outcome and we've decided to kind of carry that on um, for at least one of the terms instead of drop-ins to do the videoing because I think it you know we stress that this isn't about us watching back what happened in the lesson it's about you using it as a prompt to remember what happened and reflect on what happened just out of interest Matt I, I, I don't know if this is the same thing but I heard about one I thought it was Iris where you have it on your key fob and you um, or your tag and you can see yourself walking sort of a, a, yeah a view of, is that right are you walking around the room is that the same thing yeah so you have two one is like an environmental one and one follows you and you wear a yeah. microphone and if yeah. you really want to get technical you can have like a talk back earpiece as well where you can like coach NQTs through like from oh. a distance we haven't got that far yet um, no. but our NQTs have really embraced it actually um, and it's just um yeah it's just a really good tool to be able to encourage self-reflection rather than it always being relying on more knowledgeable others yeah no i really agree brilliant so we have um adopted the lesson study and so we've put different teachers with certain like with each other and then instead of us going to do it they are doing it themselves and feeding back to us yeah, and then really we just like we're going to begin to quality assure that so like coming up to uh, data drop so pupil progress meetings instead of us doing that they are going to do it themselves and then they're going to feed back to us and then we just go in and quality assure that mm. you know the dreaded pupil progress meetings but actually you know that's a there's not a lot of pressure then if they're doing it team in a team so mm. that's how they'll do it and then they'll feed it back to us mm. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, we, we do a similar thing as well. I think that's really important that the feedback isn't always coming from um, yeah. SLT or middle leaders. Yeah, really valuable. Thank you. Anyone else want to add any last comments? Okay, well, um, I, I, I found this, you know, really um, brilliant in terms of, um, I, was, I was worried that it would just be me talking and, and no one else participating and I'm so glad that you have because that's what my aim was for this session really um, it is about reflection on your school and taking the time to think over this hour about what you could change or what your next steps might be even if they're a long way off or they seem a bit like a mountain at the moment it's it's looking up at that mountain and facing it and saying okay well we need to find a way um the curriculum is everything and if that isn't working um then then it needs looking at um i think and hopefully this is this is some of you are obviously in very different places some of you are well on your way some of you sound like you're you could be doing this uh, this workshop yourself so you're in a really good position i think and others of you are obviously just contemplating that next step at the moment um, so i wish you all the best of luck um, and i'm really happy to um you know to uh georgina i don't know if you share email addresses or whatever but if people have questions after the session that they particularly wanted to ask i'm really happy to provide ongoing support or whatever um, but it's it's been really lovely meeting everyone so thank you for your input thank you so much jess um yeah i will i will send out a follow-up email after this session um 
with your email address in. Thank you so much for that. Um, a huge thank you to all of all of you for, for joining us this morning. I know especially when everyone is so busy, we really do welcome you joining us at these events. And a massive thank you to Jess for the time and effort you've put into this and for being so honest throughout. I think that's been really refreshing um, and holding your hands up and saying, you know, we don't have all the answers. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it's um, you know, every school is very, very different. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much for that.